Thank you very much. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I wish I could be there in person. I hope one day to visit Korea and your uh, National Institute of Food and Drug Safety Evaluation. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the renovation of ICH E8, which is general principles for clinical studies. Um, I, here are the topics I'll go through. Uh, first, I'm going to describe the goals of good clinical practice renovation of E8 and E6. I'm afraid I hear an echo. I don't know if it's on my end or, okay, seems to have disappeared. So let me continue. Uh, so I'm going to start with talking about GCP renovation of E8 and E6. Uh, and then I'm going to focus on the major changes in E8 from the original E8 to the renovation. And that includes quality by design, some changes in drug development, and study design and data sources. Before I go too long, let me just say what is E8? I already said it's titled General Considerations for Clinical Studies. It's intended to provide a broad introduction to drug development and clinical studies. It covers design, conduct, analysis, and, and reporting of clinical studies. It introduces many topics that are covered in more depth in other ICHE guidelines. And it emphasizes participant safety, the integrity of study findings, and orderly scientific and clinical development. So here is some background for E8. It was originally adopted in 1997, so that's over 20 years ago. What's different between then and now is we have a wider range of study designs and data sources that play a role in drug development. Clinical study design and conduct are more complex. Patient-focused drug development is now a key priority. And quality approaches from the 20th century are not optimal for, for the present day. Uh, there are current, this is from the ICH website. There are currently about 20 ICH efficacy guidelines. Um, and today I'm going to obviously be talking about E8, but I will have some things to say about E6 as well. So the ICH efficacy guidelines are a set of guidances covering the planning, design, conduct, safety, analysis, and reporting of clinical trials. They, they should be considered and used in an integrated holistic way rather than focusing on only one guideline or subsection. ICH E8R1 sets out general principles on the conduct of clinical studies and refers to many efficacy guidelines for further details. This suffix here, R1, refers to the renovation, the first renovation. Okay, let me define what good clinical practice is, or GCP. Uh, GCP, and if you bear with me as I read this, a standard for the design, conduct, performance, monitoring, auditing, recording analysis, and reporting of clinical trials that provides assurances, assurance that data and the reported results are credible and accurate and the rights, integrity, and confidentiality of trial subjects are protected. Now, I've un underlined two key points here, that the results are credible and accurate, and the trial subjects are protected. Those are the key elements of GCP, and this definition comes from the ICH E6 document. Um, as I said, E8 came from, uh, dates back, the original E8 dates back from 1997, uh, and there was a, this uh, ICH and its member parties recognized a need for the renovation of the GCP guidances. So there was a reflection paper titled GCP Renovation, Modernization of e, ICH E8 and Subsequent Renovation of ICH E6. That came out in January 2017. The plan was to renovate E8 first and introduce this concept quality by design and appro approaches and a wider range of study designs and data sources. I'll, I'll talk about what quality design is later in this talk. And then subsequently, E6, good clinical practice was to be renovated and it will refer to the renovated E8 on study quality principles and study design and data sources. The, the overall goals of this renovation were is to address, is to, to be flexible to address increasing diversity of clinical studies and data sources, address modern approaches to quality management, 
um, and be appropriate for trials and studies that support regulatory decisions. Now, if you, if you want to read this renovation paper, I have the link on the bottom. Uh, the work on E8 is now complete, as you'll see, and the work on the renovation of E6 is ongoing. Uh, so here's a, here's a brief timeline. I'll just emphasize again the E8 aspects here. It was originally finalized in 1997. A draft of the renovation uh, was released in 2019. Uh, in November 2019, the E6 expert working group was established to do the renovation of E6. And E8, the renovation, R1, was finalized in October 2021 and is currently being adopted by the, the member parties. The US FDA has adopted uh, E8, R1. So it's official US FDA guidance now. Okay, here's a table of contents from the renovated E8. Um, I'm going to focus on section three and section five, which is where most of the new material is in E8 R1 compared to the original E8. I'll have a little bit to say about section four, drug development planning. Um, in the interest of time, I'll, I'm going to skip and move quickly through some slides, including this slide on the objectives of the document. Uh, if, of course, you can read the document, which is available on the ICH website, uh, to uh, get the details. Okay, the general principles of the document are the protection of clinical study participants. Uh, I'm not sure how used to you're using the word participants. Uh, previously, people would use the word clinical study subjects, uh, but we try to be more respectful for the people in our studies. So the document and common usage now uh, refers to them as re refers to these people as participants. So the, the first principle in E8 is the protection of the study pr participants. Uh, the, the second principle is a scientific approach to clinical study design, conduct, and analysis. This is an orderly scientific approach where each study builds upon the results of, of previous studies in a logical way. And then the last general principle I'll discuss is patient input into study design, uh, that the input of patients will likely make the study more feasible and make the results more meaningful to the patients. Okay, now I'm gonna discuss section three, designing quality into clinical studies. This is a brand new section and one of the major reasons for the renovation of E8. Okay, in E8 R1, quality of a clinical study is considered as fitness for purpose. Uh, that may be an unusual term, fitness for purpose. What it's referring to is, the quality is related to what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, you may do a very good job in one aspect of a study, but if it's not related to what you're ultimately trying to accomplish, it isn't a, a quality study. So it should be fit for the purpose of your study. Um, and going along those lines, the focus should be on what matters to get accurate and reliable results and to protect participant safety. So an example, um, Collecting and verifying clinical measurements that are not related to the objectives of the study or participant safety may reduce the quality by creating unnecessary burdens. This notion of, um, of quality by design uh, was introduced by the City Group, uh, which I leave a website, a link for a website here if you want to hear more about that. But I'll go on and talk about what E8 has to say about it. Uh, so quality by design involves a prospective multidisciplinary approach to promote the quality in a manner proportional, proportionate to the risk involved and clear communications of how this will be achieved. So again, the use proportional, proportionate, meaning you're going to do more work for what matters and less focus on things that don't matter for the objectives of your study. There's a confusing but sent, well, there's a new but an important concept in this is called the critical to quality factor. Uh, these are attributes of the study whose integrity is fundamental to the protection of the study participants and the reliability and interpretability of the study results. 
I'm going to give an example here because I, this is a somewhat of a complex, complex uh, concept here. So this is a made up example, but the example is maintaining ultra cold storage of an investigative drug product A. So why, why is this critical? Well, without ultra cold storage, product A will chemically degrade. This may affect the efficacy of the product and also present a safety risk to the trial participants. Uh, so what do you do? What sort of mitigation strategies could you employ? So you can employ <clears throat> proper and reliable equipment for the transport and storage of the investigative drug. And you can provide training for personnel to maintain the ultra cold storage. So I hope this gives you some flavor of what a critical quality factor is. Uh, the example, why it's, why it's critical, and how you might mitigate the risk to it. Okay, um, I'm only gonna briefly touch upon this, but there are uh, several principles to quality by design. And of course, please read the document to, hear, to learn more about this or refer to that city website I provided a few slides ago. So quality by design has several principles. So the first principle is to establish a culture that supports open dialogue. So of course you want everyone to be able to speak up and not be intimidated to speak up if they have like a good idea or recognize some issue that needs to be brought to the attention uh, of the study investigators. Uh, we've already talked a lot about focusing on activities essential to the study. This is a, you know, a key concept in quality by design. Engage stakeholders in study design. So these are, again, patients. You want to make sure patients have input into your study design. There's also probably your healthcare providers and your study investigators. And all this will help to make the study like more feasible, more likely to uh, accomplish its objectives and ultimately be meaningful for patients. And then finally, to review these critical of the quality factors. So, you know, I, I gave an example of a critical of the quality factor, but as the study progresses, new critical quality factors might be identified and old ones might be revised, including the mitigation strategies. Okay, section four um, is on drug development planning. And I'm only going to say a little bit here. I think many of you are probably familiar with the drug development process going from preclinical work like discovery, safety and efficacy in animals, to early clinical work like human pharmacology for safety, drug activity, exploratory for dosing, uh, target and population safety, confirmatory for efficacy and safety, and post-approval, uh, which is generally maybe safety or use in practice. So this is drug development process. It's, it, the document uh, clarifies this should be an orderly process where each stage learns from the previous stage and builds upon it. Uh, traditionally, this is expressed in phases, like phase one clinical studies, phase two clinical studies. Uh, uh, the ICHE8 R1 has de-emphasized the use of the terminology phases. It's, it's still there, uh, but it's de-emphasized. And that's partly because drug development nowadays doesn't always fall neatly into the four phases. For example, some drugs may be approved on phase two studies. And then there are some uh, studies that span multiple phases, uh, like a seamless adaptive study may choose a dose, may study several doses, select a dose, and then use that dose for a confirmatory study all in one seamless study. So the, the use of the phases are, are, not so, um, are, are not so cut and dry nowadays are not so clear. So the, the document sort of de-emphasizes them. There is an appendix, um, there is an appendix to the document that gives some examples of, of all these types of studies. Okay, the last section uh, that I'll discuss in detail and one of the major changes in the renovation from the original document is section five, design elements and data sources for clinical studies. Okay, an there's an introduction uh, in this section, uh, and it basically says there there's a wide range of study designs and data sources to uh, address study objectives. 
Uh, so different study designs and different data sources may be uh, more, more valuable for certain objectives than the others. Um, the um, document talks about both randomized studies and non-randomized studies and makes the point that randomized studies, uh, well, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, um, another point in the introduction is that uh, you should have clear objectives because clear objectives will help specify the study design. And the study, <clears throat> and these study objectives are further refined through the specification of estimates. Now, estimates are uh, a relatively new concept introduced in ICHE 9 uh, R1. Um, I don't know if there's any sort of training on R1. Uh, but this, the R1 is all about estimates, and it's, it's a rather statistical concept, but it's meant to uh, clarify the objectives and sort of improve communications uh, between the various uh, study parties, like statisticians and clinicians. Um, so if you want to learn more about estimates, uh, please refer to E9R1. Um, the introduction also makes a point that interventional studies and in particular, randomized studies play a central role in drug development as they can better control biases. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that. Studies without randomization, whether they're interventional, like a single arm study or an observational study, can play a role in certain settings when randomization is not feasible. And that's where a lot of the interest in real world evidence is in the, is in the non-randomized case although real world evidence can be based on randomized studies as well. Okay, um, so this, this graphic is trying to relate the study objectives, the study design, and the critical quality factors together. So naturally, the study objectives should motivate the study design. So uh, there's a direction that's mainly going towards the right from study to objectives to study design. Uh, but based on design considerations, there might be some refinement of the study objectives, which is represented by the dash line going back. Uh, both, <clears throat> both the study objectives and the study design should motivate the critical quality factors. So one of the points of this design specification that I'm going to talk about is to motivate these critical quality factors for the particular study. What ICHE E8R1 does is breaks up the study design into seven elements. Uh, those elements are listed on this slide, and I won't go into detail here, but of course refer to the document for the details, uh, but I'll quickly go through them. Um, the first element is study population. Uh, study population is basically who's in your study your inclusion exclusion criteria. And based on your study objectives, uh, the population may be defined differently. Like for example, an early clinical uh, study versus a late clinical study may have different populations where an early phase may have a, kind of a narrow inclusion criteria to best understand the drug. Later, later clinical development is likely to have a more real world population to represent how the drug would be used in the real world. Um, the next element is called treatment description. So this is basically a specific description of the study drug and the control treatments in your study. So this would include like the dosage, the, uh, the frequency of the dose, the duration, the background therapy, perhaps rescue therapy. So it's a very specific description of what treatments are being evaluated. Uh, the next element is the choice of control group. There's a whole ICH guideline, let me see, E10, on the choice of control group. I, I personally consider that an excellent uh, guideline if you're interested. Uh, it has a lot, of, it was it's written some time ago, but the material is still uh, very relevant. Uh, I mean, it will talk, that document goes into more detail about different types of control groups. Uh, in, in E8, uh, most of the discussion centers around internal versus external control groups. So, um, external control groups would certainly be a non-randomized case. Um, and um, the document describes some of the challenges of using external controls. Uh, response variables, uh, that's pretty obvious. That's, you, you know, a, a surrogate, a biomarker, or a clinical outcome that you're interested in measuring. 
and that usually defines the endpoints of your study. Um, another element are the methods to, to reduce bias. Uh, I've already mentioned randomization is one of the, perhaps the key element, the key method to reduce bias, but it also discusses blinding. And the, and the document also discusses some of the challenges and biases associated with observational studies. Uh, the study element uh, statistical analysis describes uh, the need for pre-specified protocols and SAPs. And finally, the last element, a very important element is study data, uh, which I'm gonna spend a few slides on here. I wanna make sure there's no messages that I'm missing. Okay, uh, so study data. Um, Traditionally, study data for clinical studies have come from case report forms. And you know, originally they were paper, you know, now they're electronic, but they're special data collection efforts that are designed to collect data specifically for, uh, for the study. Uh, nowadays, there's a lot of interest in existing data sources. Uh, a lot of them are, are referred to as real world data sources. These are data sources that exist irrespective or outside the study that might be able to be used for the study. And some examples of that are electronic medical records, uh, patient reported outcomes, and certain digital health technologies. Uh, for example, a continuous glucose monitor. Um, the document makes the distinction between primary data collection and secondary data use. So this basically relates to what I just described. Primary data collection are data collected specifically for the study, uh, where secondary data use is the use of data in your study that existed outside of your study. And the document describes uh, you know, some of the pluses and minuses of these two sources of data. Uh, it also defines data quality. Uh, and using these, these three attributes, uh, consistency, which refers to the uniformity of ascertainment over time, accuracy, the correctness of collection, transmission, and processing, and completeness, uh, which is the lack of missing information. Okay, so I've gone through all the elements um, in design elements, and now I'd like to give a simple example um, again, this is sort of a made-up example, how we could break down a study into these elements. So the example here is a single-arm intervention with an external control. So what would the population be? Well, that could be stage two pancreatic cancer patients naive to therapy. Now, I include dot, dot, dots here because in reality, there'd be a lot more inclusion exclusion criteria or a lot more specificity. Uh, the treatment descriptions, uh, for example, the experimental drug A, you know, dose 10 milligrams daily for six weeks. The control is drug B, dose five milligrams daily for six weeks. Uh, the choice of control group, uh, external patients from a previous trial, the response variable might be progression-free survival. Um, methods to reduce or assess bias. Well, this is a little tricky because this is a non-randomized case uh, with the external control and blinding is difficult, but conceivably you might be able to choose the previous control data without knowledge of the outcomes. Um, maybe that's not very likely, uh, but another, possible way to reduce bias is to apply the present inclusion criteria to the patients in the previous trial. And the study data is the present trial data and this previous trial, previous trial data. So that's just kind of a somewhat made up example to, uh, to display how you'd break up a study into these seven elements. Okay, as I said previously, um, the, the elements, or help you motivate the critical to quality factors. Um, let's see if I have, I'll see how much time I have here. Let me certainly go through the first one. So we already talked, the first design element is population. So what critical to quality factors might that motivate? So are the risks to the intervention group sufficiently characterized? 
Remember, the, the, one of the objectives of the critical equality factors is to ensure that the participant safety. So before you do the study, you have to make sure it's safe to, um, to uh, provide this drug to this population. Can sufficient number of subjects, I should say participants, be identified and agreed to participate? Uh, you're not gonna have a very feasible study if you can't get a number of subjects, a sufficient number of subjects in the, in the study. Uh, so you might see if your population definition is feasible to actually run. Um, and along those lines, are all inclusion exclusion criteria necessary? Uh, and remember, we wanna just focus on what's essential. Um, and are they well-defined and valuable? Because if they're not well-defined and valuable, it's gonna be difficult to implement. Um, let me, I don't think I'll be able to go through all of them, but let me go through another one. So the choice, the control group. Are the control subjects similar enough to the interventional group in terms of risk factors and standard of care. Uh, because if they're not, you're likely going to have biases in, in your overall result, and that would call into question the accuracy of your results. Uh, you can, uh, you'll have these slides to refer to later, so I, I, in the interest of time, I, I'm going to move on to the last two elements here. Okay, so moving back to the table of contents, um, you know, I've covered um, general principles, designing quality into studies. I said a brief word on drug development planning. It's actually a very large section. Uh, if you're not familiar with drug development planning or you wanna provide a reference to a colleague on drug development planning, I actually think it's a very good section. Uh, but I don't think necessarily there's a lot of material that someone who already works in the field doesn't already know. Um, this, I spent a fair amount of time on design elements and data sources. That's uh, brand new in the renovation. Uh, there's a section on conduct, safety, and monitoring and reporting. Uh, some of that material has been renovated. Some of it is from the, exist from the previous E8. And finally, there's a conclusion, a rather short, um, a short section on, on considerations for identifying these critical equality factors. And as I said previously, there's an annex that gives examples of clinical studies that in a lot of ways ties back to the drug development planning section. Uh, so that's, that's basically what I intended to cover today. Uh, this was the expert working group at one meeting. Um, I think this one was probably in North Carolina. Uh, there were people that um, didn't attend every meeting. Uh, so there are not everyone's here, but there was a hardworking group. Uh, and uh, we met through over several years and uh, produced a draft and final version of the document. And so with that, um, I'd like to thank you for your attention.